Hello there. Uh, my name is Derek Taylor. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, this is my video recording of the lecture I just gave a couple of days ago uh, in person, Evolution in the Catholic Church, 1859 to the present, uh, controversies in church history. If you tuned in uh, on Zoom uh, on Monday and uh, on, excuse me, on Sunday and didn't, uh, didn't uh, get to see it, I apologize. Had some technical difficulties. I get that fixed for next time. But without further ado, uh, here is the lecture that I gave uh, on Monday, more or less. Hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, and we'll so let's get started. Let's get into this and get started and uh, see how we can do from here. So uh, evolution in the Catholic Church, 1859 to the present. Uh, this is the handout I uh, gave to people who came to the lecture on uh, on Sunday. And so we're going to start out talking about terms here and talking about Darwin and his idea. And just a few things to begin with, definitions. Uh, evolution, uh, just as a general term, refers to the way that organic species change over time. For, in fact, of course, evolve can mean, and evolution can mean just change in general. And in fact, prior to uh, Charles Darwin, uh, the term um, evolution was actually used to refer to the development of an individual human embryo in the womb. Uh, and in fact, that ev term evolution is kind of uh, a little bit vague. It can refer to several things. Uh, and this is the reason why, if you look into Darwin's first work on the origin of species, you won't find the term evolution anywhere in it. Uh, he thought it was too vague and he was concerned about that. He even has in, or at least in my edition I have when I teach this, uh, teach Darwin at Johnson County Community College, um, it actually has a glossary he put in there, I think in the second edition, uh, never mentions it. So it's interesting uh, thing to note. Two other main terms, because these are, these are the basic uh, principles upon which modern evolutionary theory going back to Darwin are based. This is Darwin's, Darwin's essential um, contribution. One is the idea of natural selection. That is to say the best, the uh, species best adapted to their local habitat, their local environment will pass on their trait, will survive and pass on their traits while other species will fail to and then disappear. And the second term is common ancestry. This is the other idea Darwin had that all organic life on earth has a common ancestor. And so this is his, uh, this is the background we're talking about here. The other thing we need to talk about with Darwin is that this idea of evolution is not purely a scientific idea. It has philosophical antecedents. Uh, in fact, it goes back to um, the ancient world, um, to pre-Socratic uh, Greek philosophy. Pre-Socratic means before Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, to philosophers who broached ideas of a, a changing world or a developing universe or developing biological species anyway, uh, they were basically done away with, with the influence of Aristotle. Aristotle taught that the species were fixed more or less. They could change over time, but what Darwin's talking about is something more specific. This is the novelty of Darwin, is that you have the change from one species to another through that process that is described. And so uh, you have ancient theories in the background. You also have modern ideas of evolution before we even get to Darwin. There are several. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who was also a scientist, uh, came up with the theory of evolution. But the most famous people to know about heard the public for his ideas in uh, in Western civilization uh, two, were two. One, Jean-Baptiste Jean Lamarck, French uh, scientist, who worked out a, a theory of evolution which uh, said that species started out as simple forms and developed into uh, more complex forms. But of course, he is best remembered uh, for his idea that uh, inheritance, for the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Uh, this means that if you acquire some sort of physical characteristic in a lifetime, you get buff at the gym, you'll pass it on to your to your descendants, which alas is not true. Uh, and he thought of human beings as being the sort of endpoint of this process. He thought it was a teleological process that still had a purpose built into it. Darwin denied that basically. The other person who uh, publishes a theory of evolution before Darwin is a man named Robert Chambers, who is a amateur Scottish biologist, published a book called The Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation in 1844, which progressed that species developed progressively from lower to higher forms. And this did a lot 
caused a lot of sensation, but it did a lot to uh, pave the way for Darwin. His book was popular, therefore accessible, not exactly accurate in a lot of ways. And in fact, many people in America and in Britain before uh, before Darwin published, they got their ideas about evolution from him. In fact, a lot of people probably didn't read <laughs> Darwin on a, on a popular level uh, compared to other uh, authors. And then finally, two men from whom, from whom uh, Darwin got ideas who were not biologists at all. Uh, one is Charles Lyell, geologist, uh, from whom he took the doctrine of uniformitarianism. This is the idea that uh, natural laws or laws in nature, processes like he thinks evolution, operate uniformly throughout time and space. They are invariant, essentially. And so this will be a key thing for Darwin. The other thing he takes from uh, a thinker, and this is even more interesting, is Thomas Malthus, who wrote uh, an essay in 1798, the name of which escapes me, I think it's an essay on human population, which argued that, I'm gonna put this in terms that are probably false, that population, uh, excuse me, that food supply uh, 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 increases arithmetically, that's say arithmetically, and then uh, human population uh, re uh, uh, grows geometrically, which is to say, Human population, if left unchecked, grows a lot faster than the food supply, which is why Malthus, you get the term Malthusian for people who think you need to control the population. And so Darwin took this idea and applied it to the natural world that species are fighting over limited resources. So he has influences in that regard. And then finally, just a little bit about Darwin himself, if you don't know, uh, born in 1809, dies in 1882 came from an illustrious family. I mentioned his grandfather Erasmus was a scientist, his father was a doctor. Uh, Darwin was intended uh, to be, be a clergy, to be a, a, a doctor, went to, went to Edinburgh in Scotland to study it, thought he didn't like it, and instead went to Cambridge with the intent of becoming a clergyman, in fact. But at Cambridge, he met several professors of, uh, of science there, and one of them got him a post on the HMS Beagle, where he spent six years going around the globe collecting and gathering samples of plant and animal, uh, animal life, and which sealed his decision to become a scientist. And his publication of the research from the voyage made him, made his name in the scientific community. And I should mention, by the way, he comes from, when I say illustrious, he comes from a, a fairly well-off background. He's a gentleman. Uh, he lives off the family fortune. He doesn't have to work. And so uh, he's one of the last gentleman scientists uh, in, our, in, in history, basically. And so from there, he works out for the next 20 years or so his idea of evolution, which when he publishes it, or he's about ready to publish it in 1859, he gets a nasty shock. And one of his younger colleagues, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, has also worked on a theory of evolution similar to his, independently of him, and actually kind of slightly got there first. But Wallace is younger, less well-established, and by the way, he's not a gentleman. He's not from the uh, from that class. So he defers to Darwin. And so he gets his theory out there first. And he publishes his work on the origin of species, the shortened title in 1859, where he publishes that idea of mechanism. And again, what's novel about this, what shocks some people is two things. One, the, 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 the nature of the process of natural selection, which seems you know, kind of cold and heartless. But also the fact that, again, species are no longer seen to be fixed. That's the first thing they seem to be changing. The second thing, of course, is that he's basically saying that species got there through a natural process. And he sort of uh, gets rid of God's providence and gets rid of direct creation of natural species. And so that's uh, his uh, assertion that new species are caused by this is what really strikes some people that's why sometimes that's why his uh, theory is sometimes called in the 19th century the transmutational theory or the transformational theory because we're talking about the transformation of species. Now, in terms of the book itself, origin, he doesn't talk about human beings, um, and in fact, in the in the second edition of the Origin of Species, he actually inserts several passages where he inserts the word creator with a capital C <laughs> into certain parts of it, uh, I suppose to appease his critics to a certain degree. But in later editions, um, he begins to sort of use terms we're familiar with, things like survival of the fittest, which he did not coin that term, by the way. Uh, Herbert Spencer and Alfred Wallace were the ones that did that. And eventually he does, uh, a little over 20 years later, 
uh, excuse me, 13 years later, uh, publish a book where he applies his theory to human beings, the descent of man. And he basically talks about human beings as that they are part of this natural, excuse me, natural process. So, okay, so you have Darwin's uh, theory making a splash. How do people react to this? We're talking about the Catholic Church, we'll get to that in a moment, that'll take up most of the lecture, but our early reactions from 18, 1859, publishing the origins up to the late 1870s. Well, let's talk about non-Catholic responses first. And the thing to note about all of these, by the way, is there's actually a greater variety of responses than you might think. Yes, there was controversy. As you're gonna see, it gets more controversial later on in some regards. And first of all, the scientific community. Uh, for the most part, most scientists greet his theory with acceptance. They, they accept common ancestry pretty easily. However, most scientists also disagree with certain aspects of on the origin of species. Partly because, and this is something I didn't mention, on the origin of species is not technically speaking a scholarly work. It's intended for the broad public. It sells pretty well for a, a science book. And it lacks the normal scholarly apparatus, footnotes and the like. And so there's there's makes problems of of uh, understanding what he wants to get at, the reasons why he's making some of the arguments he's making. It also means the origin of the species is fairly easy to read, easier to read. He's actually a very good writer, uh, was Darwin, by the way. And one of the key things most scientists had a problem with was his dis was a disagreement with him over the role of natural selection in causing variations between species. To give you an example, most French scientists were very skeptical of natural selection, uh, as was Thomas Huxley, uh, his great defender, sometimes called Darwin's bulldog, got into a famous uh, debate with, um, well, I can't remember which one, but one of the Wilberforce brothers who was a clergyman over this. Uh, Huxley disagreed. He didn't think natural selection explained all the variations in, uh, in natural uh, species. Uh, and Huxley actually fell out with him a little bit at the end of his life over this. Others criticized the uh, lack of evidence in the fossil record uh, uh, as in terms of explaining his idea or backing it up. This was something, by the way, he anticipates in the origin of species itself. And in fact, uh, the, um, the beginnings of genetic science take place in the 1870s. The Austrian monk, or Mendel does experiments. Darwin never takes notice of them uh, in his lifetime. In fact, uh, no one does really, uh, thinks to combine genetics with uh, Darwinian evolution until the 1920s and 30s. This will spark the creation of what's sometimes called in, in scientific literature, the neo-Darwinian synthesis. But uh, at the time we're left sort of uh, things to criticize for some, for some scientists. What about Protestant reactions? Now, if you know anything about reactions to Darwin, even if you're a Catholic, you probably have in your head this, um, because it does have an immediate, and in some ways, uh, devastating impact on certain parts of the Protestant world. Of course, in the Anglophone world, if you're listening to this, you're probably, probably uh, English is your first language. If not, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I hope this is going well for you. But it did in some Protestant countries, in Britain and America, you have people who are who take uh, Genesis strictly literally. And so this became a problem for some people. We have examples of people like Philip Goss, who was a an evangelical minister, amateur scientist, who tried to you know make arguments like, you know, fossils were hidden in the record by God to test people's faith in Genesis and stuff like this. Darwin actually mocked him in later editions of his his work. I think it's kind of cruel, but uh, and in fact, we know this, we know about this stuff with Goss, um, had a big impact on him. Uh, his son, Edmund, uh, became a man of letters later in his life and a free thinker. And in his autobiography, uh, he talks about his loss of belief being tied to Darwin and also a falling out with his father over this. So there's some real painful episodes. It used to be, I say this because it used to be that was the whole story. Historians have become a little more uh, emphasized to a, a greater degree today. There is more um diversity of reaction than you think at first um even if it dismayed some uh protestants who who held a literal belief other protestants uh other uh evangelicals even there were a few of those um accepted darwin's theory without a whole lot of uh, uh storm on drong and in fact in general it's really only later um 
uh, after Darwin explicitly applies his theory to, to, uh, to humans and descent of man, that his work begins to attract a lot more criticism. Um, and in fact, it only blows up, of course, in the United States um, in things like the Scopes trial after the 1910s. And there's another reason for that besides applying this to human beings. The other reason is that in the late 19th century across Europe and the United States, you have the creation of national education systems or attempts at this, which are secular in nature. And some of the people doing this don't like the various churches very much. <laughs> and they quite frankly want to use Darwin as a way to undermine, <laughs> undermine uh, of the authority of these various religious bodies. That's the reason it becomes uh, more of a problem later on. You also, of course, have the reaction of people who, from the beginning, there are thinkers, philosophers, even scientists, who see the polemical value in what Darwin's going to publish very quickly. There are, as I'm sure you're aware, after the French Revolution and its uh, fallout in France, plenty of scientists who are anti-clerical who immediately take up Darwin as a cudgel to beat the church within France. In the United States and elsewhere, people like Robert Ingersoll, who was a, a scientist and, and a, a lecturer, um, used this as a club, published a book saying that this proves that science is incompatible with religion. Uh, people like Ernst Haeckel, I think I'm pronouncing his right, he's a German scientist who becomes a, uh, a fan of, a, a supporter of Darwin, who is also openly uh, anti-clerical and uses Darwin's theory and presents it, presents it as anti-religious to the public. Uh, and, all, uh, and above all, John William Draper was an English-born American scientist who wrote a book in 1874 called The History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, in which he presents uh, evolution as just the latest in a long line of uh, allegedly alleged incidents where that prove that religion and science conflict. So you have, and this is going to be very important for why over time you have people turn against uh, uh, evolutionary theory in many ways. And then finally, one last thing to note about this is the press. This is the first age of mass public opinion, mass newspapers, mass learning in Europe and the United States, and in many countries, you know, Anglophone countries, certainly they're Protestant countries, the press can be very, secular press can be very anti-Catholic. And of course, there's a secular anti-Catholic press in places like France, even though it's Catholic, over a number of issues, but particularly with evolution. And you'll have Catholic, um, you know, um, the Catholic press will respond in kind, the same of a polemic. But to give you an idea of, of what they, you know, kind of, the kind of mud that gets uh, slung. Uh, in America, for example, in the 1880s, the New York, New York Evening Telegram published a caricature of an Irish servant girl with, quote, a, the mouth of a, mouth of a baboon and horns upon her, unquote. And this, again, this idea of, you know, again, people being backward because of their religion, because of their, because of their ethnic affiliation. In the United States and in Britain, by the way, specifically for Catholics, um, most Catholics in, in England, for example, were Irish immigrants. A lot of Catholics in the United States in the 19th century are immigrants. So this goes together, and I'm not, I don't have time to get anything, anything like social Darwinism, with what are middle class prejudices. The, 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 uh, the broad educated public in, in Anglophone world is, is pretty anti-Catholic anyway. And of course, you have pockets of that elsewhere as well. So these are all the sorts of things that, by the way, the press, public opinion is going to weigh on Catholic thinkers and uh, the church itself, members of the hierarchy. So finally, we get to Catholic opinion. What, what's the reaction of the Catholic press and opinion initially to Darwin? Well, in England, the first, that's where he publishes, the first um, published reviews of Origin of Species in 1859 by two journals, one English, the other um, Irish. Uh, the Rambler in England published the first one in uh, 1860, a uh, review of his book, which rejected uh, his theory as being materialistic um, in philosophical terms, uh, claimed it was merely a recycling of ancient theories. A couple months later, a uh, similar review uh, comes out in the Dublin Review uh, from, uh, from Dublin which is a little more positive, it praised Darwin's uh, marshalling the evidence for his theory, but criticized his theory uh, as being unsound and unproven, especially when it came to natural selection. And in fact, you're gonna have opinion in Ireland turn against evolution in the 1870s, 
when one of these, uh, again, anti-religious scientists uh, delivers a lecture in Belfast, 1874, and in John Tyndall, a lecture to a local meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And there he basically pushed the anti-religious implications of Darwinian theory, which provoked a reaction both from Catholics and Protestants in Belfast. Belfast is in Northern Ireland. And from that point on, basically until the middle of the 20th century, Irish Catholics had turned a, turn a dim eye on evolutionary theory. However, when he publishes Descent of Man in 1971, I don't want to go too far with this, there is, there is some movement and there is a, a little bit of a mixed opinion on certain things. There's, there's a range of opinion among Catholics as there are among other people to his work. And just to give you an idea of what I think the middle ground is by the end of the 1870s, I'll give you this part of the review um, from the Dublin Review, his review, their review of Descent of Man in 1872 in which they say, quote, the position of faith then with regard to theories of evolution appears to be this. It is not contrary to faith to suppose that all living things up to man exclusively were evolved by natural law out of minute life, germs primarily or even out of organic, inorganic matter. On the other hand, it is heretical to deny the separate and special creation of the human soul. And to question the immediate and instantaneous or quasi-instantaneous formation by God of the bodies of Adam and Eve, of the former in, in, uh, in, by inorganic matter, for the latter out of the rib, rib, uh, rib of Adam, is at least rash and perhaps proximate to heresy, unquote. That kind of sums up, I think, in some ways, the middle ground here. Some people were like, okay, we can accept natural selection of other living beings can accept the natural evolution of the soul. That's materialism 101. But it's also the question of the creation of the bodies of Adam and Eve by God. So that seems to be wrong too. So you have that, that opinion there. In Europe, to move to European opinion, uh, negative opinion of, of Darwin's work is led by none, none other than the uh, journal La Civilta Catolica, if you don't know what this is, this is the Jesuit journal, which is still, still in print today, formed in the 1850s, which for the better part of the period we're under discussion here is the main organ of opposition in the Catholic world. Uh, if you don't know, the Jesuits run this, this, uh, this paper. It was taken to be the sort of de facto organ, organ of opinion for the papacy because they submitted their their uh, additions to the, to, to the Vatican for vet, theological vetting. Uh, and so it has a lot of influence on this. Uh, on the other hand, other places, there's not as much controversy. Uh, in Belgium, for example, a couple of decades before Darwin um, published Evolu uh, his uh, Origin of Species, uh, scientists had already introduced the public to an idea of evolution, which which still made human beings clearly distinct from the rest of creation. Uh, a geologist named uh, Jean de Malias Halloy uh, was responsible for much of this. And so when it was published in Belgium, there was a little outcry against Darwin uh, from the general public. Conversely, in the Netherlands next door, in the Protestant Netherlands, uh, things were quiet there until in 1868, uh, Karl Boat was a scientist and colleague and a materialist of Ernst Haeckel from Germany came to Rotterdam in 1868 and gave a speech uh, in which he uh, stressed the uh, primate ancestry of human beings, which offended Protestant and Catholic ears, and again, turned Catholics against uh, evolution in that country until well after World War II. And then finally, uh, just to give another example, in Spain, um, Darwin's theory became caught up with political disputes after 1868. Why? Because in 1868, the Spanish monarchy was replaced by a republic. And the liberal, liberal intellectuals and reformers who, who won the republic didn't like the church at all. And they drew on what they thought were the anti-religious materialistic implications of Darwinian theory. And so therefore most Spanish Catholics, not all, but most opposed it for, its, for the same reasons. They thought it was materialist. Uh, and uh, uh, supportive of revolutionary ideologies politically. So it got involved in politics and national life that way. And finally, as far as the American scene goes, uh, the initial reaction was general skepticism, um, sort of a spectrum of skepticism to a certain degree. By the 1880s, it'll be a little more, a little more of a, a divergence. 
Uh, in the 1880s, there'll be a division between the more quote unquote liberal clergy in the American hierarchy who are more supportive of it and more the more traditional clergy who are more supportive of the negative line coming from Rome. However, it should be noted again, because most Catholics in America are immigrants, most of them don't even take note of this. They don't have time, they're trying to make a life for themselves. Uh, most of them, and by the way, most, most American Catholics, most Catholics generally speaking, who are not um, you know, college educated, for the most part, never accept Darwin uh, in this period. So that's something to keep in mind. But you do have some strident opposition. I'm gonna mention one person in particular uh, one of the most fierce critics of Darwin in America was the political thinker, Orestes Brownson. If you know who Brownson is, he's a real character in American and Catholic history, went through, uh, he's a convert to Catholicism from Unitarianism of all things. He's from Massachusetts, went through, he was a Quaker, he was a Unitarian, he was a Methodist, he was this, he was that. He finally became Catholic and remained so the rest of his life for a long time. Became a big defender of, of Catholicism in the United States. Uh, from the time Darwin published Origin of Species, he lambasted him. He blamed Darwin and his evolutionary uh, theorist friends uh, for being materialists and for and called them, quote, enemies of both religion and science, unquote. Brownson wrote uh, that because they, meaning uh, Darwin's evolutionary friends, quote, uh, because they unsettle men's minds, bewilder the half-learned, mislead the ignorant, undermine the very bases of society, and assail the whole moral order of the universe, are fearfully guilty and a thousand times more dangerous to society and greater criminals even than your most noted thieves, robbers, burglars, swindlers, murderers, or midnight assassins, unquote. Uh, by the way, if you don't know who Brownson is, he's a lot of fun to read <laughs> in his own journal so he could beat the drum whenever he felt like it. He um, uh, most famous for his work on the American Constitution, but he he was a case in many ways, and he wrote against Darwin from the time up until the end of his life. In fact, the last essay he wrote, published before he died in 1876, was the uh, philosophy of the supernatural, a polemic against not just Darwinism but the overweening claims of the natural sciences. I, I'm going to read this passage. It's actually, I think, important. Uh, this is where he complains about quote. Our modern scientists who imagine that there can be science without theology who affect to treat theology as no science at all, but a vain uh, imagination or the product of a superstitious fancy, unquote. And I mention that because Brownson can be overwrought. <laughs> he can be a little excitable, but I think it's, it's interesting here because uh, again, one of the things he, he touches on is that both science and theology do make claims to knowledge, even about the natural world. If you don't know, in, uh, in 1870, the uh, First Vatican Council um, declared that um, the church, that revelation can teach us not just about the supernatural order, but about the natural, about the natural order as well. And so uh, it's something to keep in mind. I'll come back to this. Again, I don't mean to say there's, there's a necessary conflict because of this. But most modern, you know, scientists, secular people don't treat, you know, religion as anything but an opinion. The Catholic Church has never thought of its theology that way. So it's something to keep in mind. Nevertheless, um, um, through the 1870s, even, even the more liberal end, if you want to put it that way, of Catholic opinion in the United States was still hanky about Darwin. The, uh, the journal The Catholic World, which was um, published by Father Isaac Hecker, I don't know that name. He kind of gets in trouble later on uh, in the century with the Vatican, but his uh, "quote unquote" liberal Catholic world published a uh, <laughs> published, a, I believe it's an editorial in 1878, which uh, claimed to look forward to the, to the day of judgment when "quote the descent of man" Darwin's book will soon be a thing of the past, and those who now sing its praises in all tunes and feign such an enthusiastic an enthusiastic enthusiastic conviction of its coming triumph will become the laughing stock of cultivated society unless they put an end to their quote unquote scientific jugglery, unquote. So there was a lot of hesitation uh, to a certain degree among the Catholic community, broad, broad public opinion. What about the scientific community? Well, um, there was a little more openness there, but also a lot of criticism as well. In fact, 
the biggest critic, one of his biggest critics, generally speaking, was someone who actually accepted evolution. And that was St. George Mivart, a British zoologist and Catholic uh, convert to Catholicism, who in 1871 published a book called The Genesis of Species, which criticized Darwin uh, for um, rejecting his idea of natural, natu natural selection and, and uh, criticized him on other points as well. Mivart was actually a friend of Darwin and a student of all things of Thomas Huxley. And in fact, he had a falling out with Darwin over the book. Darwin actually published a second edition of The Descent of Man in order to respond to his criticisms, but he was, we have letters of this. He was deeply, deeply hurt by this because he had given you know, private assurances by Mivart that he agreed with his work. Uh, and apparently in one of his letters, he, he uh, speculated that it could only be, quote, a cursed religious bigotry, unquote, which caused Mivart to criticize him. So a uh, little bit of um, uh, hurt feelings on the part of them. So they had to part ways, as he had to do with Huxley as well. Eventually, it came to the point where he could no longer work for Huxley. Huxley was a little more gracious to him um, than, um, than, uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, Darwin was. So again, kind of a mixed reaction even in one person there. And then lastly, just to mention about the, the differing reactions among Catholic scientists, as with broader public opinion, there was a national element to this. I mentioned Belgium already. I mentioned, uh, I haven't, I haven't mentioned France. In France, most Catholics were skeptical of evolution, mainly because everybody was, even anti-clerical scientists, I mentioned those. And the reason why is most French scientists consider themselves to be positivists. You know what positivist is? Positivists are uh, people who, uh, again, it's a philosophical, um, whatever position that takes takes a, a, a takes a, puts a lot of um, a lot of uh, emphasis on positive facts positive data and they were skeptical of Darwin's theory because they thought it relied too much on speculation too little on observations too little on rigorous experiments again I think they got fooled by the fact that Darwin's book was not a scholarly work is what happened in many ways so a lot of this had to do with the way it's presented in different countries in terms of how it's responded to. So come to the third part of the lecture. What about the church itself? What about the hierarchy? What was their reaction to all this? What are they doing while all this public opinion is going on and everything? Well, the answer is not a whole lot. Uh, and in fact, for the first better part of uh, 20 years or so, they don't say much of anything do the hierarchy. And for a couple of reasons. Uh, this section I'm calling Scylla and Charybdis, 1878-1914. What do I mean by that? If you know the reference, they're having to they're having to steer a narrow course between two two problems. One, the church is very concerned uh, about the misuse of the the possible implications of Darwin's theory of being materialistic. They're afraid of how it will it will come off to the unlearned that they will people will think that somehow you know whatever God has been disproven or something like that on the one hand. So they are very, uh, this represents, generally speaking, different poles of opinion within the Vatican among its theologians and scientists. On the other hand, uh, in all the stuff I'm going to talk about in the next section of the lecture, in every document that comes from the Vatican, in every discussion about this, the name that's on everybody's lips is Galileo. The hierarchy is deathly afraid of having another Galileo situation where the church is made to look like um, they are opposing science. And by the way, if you don't know, I've given a lecture on Galileo. You should go listen to it on my YouTube channel or, or wherever you can find it on my podcast. Um, you probably, if you don't know, have a lot of propaganda in your head, to say, that, to say the least. But the church, is it's, it's on everybody's mind. They're trying to avoid. They want to protect the faith. They want to do that. But they also don't want to be seen as being too overbearing. Which is why, for a better part of 20 years, there's only one intervention from the time Darwin, Darwin publishes his work in 1859 to 1878, and that's the reaction of a provincial synod in Germany, Cologne, which pretty much unequivocally uh, uh, condemns Darwin's theory. Uh, it it uh, condemns uh, the idea that man's body was created by what it calls, quote unquote, spontaneous generation and insisted that it was indirectly created by God. And one of the things that this statement, it's not really, it doesn't really have a lot of standing. It has some because it's done by bishops, but 
Um, it's standing is one of the things it raises is the question of, okay, pretty much everybody knows that you can't say if you're a Catholic that your immortal soul was created through natural selection. That doesn't make any sense. That's an article of faith. But was the idea that man's body was created uh, <clears throat> uh, directly by God also an article of faith? And I say this because there's a debate among scholars today. Is that was that something? Because, for example, most of the early church fathers taught that, that yes, the human body was created directly by God, just like it says in Genesis. Um, Saint Augustine is a little bit of an outlier there, but most of them agreed on that. So, does that mean that's something that's binding? Could it change that sort of thing? So, that's something in the background here. But beyond that, there's nothing until 1878, when a an Italian parish priest named Raffaello uh, Cavallerni. Uh, Caval uh, Caval uh, Caval um, published a book, which I think was a textbook for students, which mentions evolution as a chapter in there, or a few chapters, in which he tries to reconcile it with Catholicism by saying it only applied, evolution only applied to animals, but not to human beings. And yet uh, it was condemned. Um, he was um, given a chance to, sub to submit to this. And he did, he, he, he submitted to, to, the, uh, to the condemnation of his book by the by the congregation for the index of prohibited books and here i need to explain the distinction between there are two bodies in the vatican at this point the congregation for the index of prohibited books and then the con congregation for the holy office uh, and the holy office is the um is the old inquisition basically um uh, comes with the holy office of i can't remember the full title but they're separate and different things they have different authority the Holy Office is directly under the directly governed by the Pope or under the authority of the Pope. The Congregation for the Index is not. The Holy Office can actually uh, can actually impose greater penalties. What the Index does is basically put uh, out a, a sort of announcement that this, such and such a book has been has been sort of found wanting in theological terms. And in fact, uh, uh, his submission, uh, uh, Caverni's submission was briefly announced only in one place, not by the Vatican, but in Cafilta Catolica, its unofficial uh, 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 journal, without even mentioning the name of his book or evolution at all. And in fact, until the Vatican archives were opened on this stuff in the late 1990s, nobody knew about it. They were virtually forgotten the moment it happened. And in fact, he published a book, did Caverni, the Cavalerni, uh, excuse me, um, three years later on the origins of uh, biological origins of man with no consequences whatsoever. And there were several other cases like this as you go forward into the late 19th century, 1890s into the early part of the 20th century. Uh, one of the more famous being uh, that of Dalmas Leroy, a French Dominican priest who published a, a book called The Evolution of Organic Species in 1887. The second edition of this uh, under the title Evolution Limited to Organic Species in 1891 sought to prove that evolution was compatible with Catholicism and that it was not necessarily materialistic or atheistic. Now, someone denounced his work to the Congregation of the Index, and his book was subsequently put on the Index and condemned. But this took place over four years. In fact, there were four different reports produced on his work. The first report uh, recommended no action be taken against him at all. The second uh, work, second report, uh, uh, only recommended that he be warned about it. The third one proposed to prohibit the book unless the law retracted, which he agreed to do readily. And it's only with the fourth report in 1895 that he was eventually, his book was actually condemned. However, the decree against the book was never made public and it never appeared on the index anywhere. And in fact, this seems to be, according to uh, some historians, I posted a book about uh, three or four years ago who studied some of the cases that came before the congregation in this period. This is basically typical of how the Vatican dealt with theologians. That is to say, they did their due diligence. They didn't just roundly condemn people automatically. What those differing reports probably indicate is that, and they actually say this is true, they have records of, of discussions about these books, is you had pretty much a freewheeling discussion, people for and against. There, and the, there are people in the Vatican who supported this stuff other people were concerned, and their concerns, by the way, always came back to what about, uh, again, what about the faith of the Bible? What about people's belief in the Bible? Uh, how can this be reconciled? 
Uh, and so this stuff is, my point is the Vatican itself is divided over this. And they do not just roundly come down on people with a sledgehammer. I say this because some people like to say this sort of thing about the pre-conciliar, I mean, pre-Vatican II church that they could be, uh, that they were just, you know, they were stifling. They just wanted to, you know, crush theologians left and right. Uh, and it is true. There were other, I, I counted about, they count, they, the book I'm referring to is about a half dozen cases or so. I think there's about maybe nine or 10 that I'm aware of where books were put on the index um, or um, they were forced to retract. There was a, a case of a, um, a Jesuit, last one I, I know of, in 1914, Eric Bossman, who was a German Jesuit. He, he was he was given a warning and he retracted his book. That's all that happened. And again, I say this because you have to understand theologians are not like normal academics. They cannot assume the same level of academic freedom, right? Because the church's main thing is not to let academics do whatever, whatever they want. It's to defend the faith. I say this because, by all accounts, uh, where I can tell, studying this, they were they were as judicious and as even-handed as they could be. They followed their procedures to the letter. There was no nothing arbitrary about what they did with people like the law. There was nobody trying to settle scores with anybody. Uh, and so you have uh, uh, you have uh, I think a better uh, a better record than sometimes the Vatican was given credit for in this period. And in fact, uh, again, this is almost wholly has to do with these condemnations, almost only has to do with theologians. The only, the only scientist that I'm aware of who got cut for this in this entire period is in fact, and this is kind of a tragedy, is our old friend St. George Mivart. Remember him, the guy who tried to, who accepted evolution, uh, who tried to argue that Catholicism was, was compatible with this, who criticized Darwin. By the end of his life, he began to believe that uh, it wasn't compatible. In fact, that science, modern science itself was not compatible with the traditional faith. And in fact, he does get, um, actually doesn't get condemned by the Vatican at all. Uh, he'll fall out with his bishop in Britain um, because he writes an article in the 1890s, or 1900s, excuse me, basically contradicting the church's teaching on, on, on hell. Uh, the article was called Happiness in Hell. I basically tried to argue that some people can be happy in hell and that they're not perpetually suffering as the church teaches. And his bishop warned him that he needed to retract this, that this was against the faith, and he refused. And in fact, he basically kept writing articles pushing this idea. And eventually, uh, the bishop checked with Rome. They said, told him what they're going to do, and they basically they signed off on him, but it wasn't Rome that did this. His bishop eventually denied him the sacraments. Uh, and he died outside the church. Again, as far as I can tell, this is all for the most part of uh, Mivart's doing. He pushed this, and in fact, uh, he wrote to, uh, to people after this was over that he was relieved. He wanted to be, he wanted to make this break, uh, and so he's the one that brought this about. But notice, of course, this has nothing to do with evolution. It's about theology, and not the scientific stuff. Uh, one last thing, and I mentioned this because he gets condemned in 19, or can you say condemned, but he was, this happens in 1902 and he dies shortly thereafter, unfortunately. This is all taking place, last thing here, during the modernist crisis, during there's a big uh, row over uh, some theologians, what they're publishing about the faith at this time. So, and I say that because one of the things that um, makes Mavart change his mind is that uh, he connects um, certain aspects of the faith with evolution in a way I don't think is actually accurate, but it's it's very similar to what's going to happen in the modernist crisis, which back next time is my next lecture is about the modernist crisis. So all this is going on while the church is doing this. One related note as well, during the same time frame, up to, night, up to World War I, basically. The church is also very concerned, the Vatican's concerned, about uh, the Bible and particularly about the higher criticism, modern biblical study in uh, universities and what it might do to the faith. And so in order to revival, revitalize biblical studies in the church, Pope Leo XIII issues an encyclical in 1893 called Proventantissimus Deus, in which he uh, laments uh, the fact that some people, quote, make evil use of physical science, minutely scrutinize the sacred book in order to detect the writers in mistake and to take occasion to vilify its contents, unquote. Uh, he was especially worried about what he called, quote, the ignorant masses of people, unquote. He was worried about how this would, uh, what effect this would have uh, on ordinary people. And again, don't take too personally his 
talking about people as being ignorant. Most Catholics probably didn't have, especially in like the states and other places, uh, a higher level of their education. And so he's worried about them losing their faith. Uh, and so this is one of the things he, uh, uh, he talks about in the encyclical. Uh, he reiterates, by the way, the Catholic dogma that truths of, the, of science and truths of the faith cannot conflict. Uh, and admonishes both theologians and scientists to stick to the limits of their disciplines and all of this. And uh, however, wanting to defend the faith, he also says uh, some interesting things. He says that in interpreting uh, scripture, he says that its authors, quote, did not seek to penetrate the secrets of nature, but rather described and dealt with things in more or less figurative language or in terms which were commonly used at the time and which in many instances are in daily use at this day, even by the most eminent men of science, unquote. Furthermore, he goes on to say that, quote, the unshrinking defense of the Holy Scriptures does not require we should equally uphold all the opinions which each of the fathers or the more recent interpreters have put forth in explaining it. For it may be that in commenting on passages where physical matters occur, they have sometimes expressed the ideas of their own times, and thus made statements which in these days have been abandoned as incorrect. Uh, and so on. And so he's basically is uh, sort of opening up a little middle ground there. Um, that yes, even though we can take the scripture seriously, not everything is expressed in a language that was meant to be totally descriptive in a in a sort of naturalistic way. And uh, in fact, this is going to be followed up in the early part of the uh, 20th century. He will establish the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1902 before he dies. And in the early uh, 20th century, in 1909, the PBC is actually still in existence, by the way. It changed its colors or was re restructured in the 1970s, but it's still around. It, um, it responded to questions, uh, to dubia about certain topics. And in 1909, it answered seven dubia or questions relating to Genesis, the first three chapters of Genesis. And it came to a couple of conclusions. And I'm not going to read from the text here, but basically it comes to the conclusion that you can't teach that Genesis doesn't contain an account of actual events. That is to say, you can't say it's a myth that somebody made it up, that it's purely symbolic, it's purely an allegory. It says that basically, um, I am quoting here, it, that it gives an account which, quote, corresponds to objective reality and historical truth, unquote. It also says you can't undermine the literal historical sense in terms of the, the, what it calls facts narrated, uh, unquote, unquote, in the, in, the, uh, in the text. So it upholds the idea that Genesis refers to real history. It's not a myth. On the other hand, uh, in responding to questions, it also says, and I'm, I am quoting here that, quote, each and every, uh, it said it's not necessary to hold that, quote, each and every word and phrase occurring in the aforesaid chapters always and necessarily must be understood in its literal sense, unquote, nor that, quote, unquote, the exactness of the scientific language must be always meticulously sought for in the interpretation of these matters. Um, because the books were, weren't written as a scientific textbook. In other words, I'll sum this up for you if that's a little too complicated. Yes, Genesis refers to real events, but it's not always told in straightforward language. And so we don't always, the language itself may be referring to a real event, but not, but in a sort of metaphorical way. So in other words, we don't necessarily have to take literal every single word that happens in the text. So it cuts a fine line there in trying to uphold uh, the truth of the Bible. Now, so we're coming coming to the end here. We're getting to what the church actually teaches eventually. We'll get to there, get to this in the in the text. Part four, the road to humani generis, uh, 1914 to 1950. Despite the problems with some theologians, despite some of this stuff about Bible and other sorts of things, there are in fact attempts to come to uh, grips with the evolution in this period before 1950. Um, most of them done by, not most, but a lot of them done by neo-scholastic uh, theologians. These are neo-Thomas theologians, people trained in that tradition of St. Thomas. And in fact, there are actually a good number of publications which basically allow for evolution, at least in the context of the evolution of uh, species other than human beings, or that at least uh, allow for evolution but uh, uh, are dubious about natural selection. And you can find them in pretty traditional sounding places. If you know what the old 
Catholic Encyclopedia was. It was an encyclopedia published in the early 20th century. It, you can go online and find it. It's uh, newadvent.org. They have an article there on evolution, which is, again, a little bit, again, it's kind of that middle position I talked about earlier, the Dublin Review, still kind of uh, clings close to that. Uh, but moreover, you're going to have a number of scholastic manuals. These are teaching manuals, which are used for teaching uh, seminarians uh, in seminary, which will which will uh, treat of evolution and talk about it in the ways in which, yes, in certain ways, it can be reconciled with the Catholic faith. And I'm talking several decades before 1950, before Humanity Generous is actually issued. A bunch of them. And in fact, this is 1952, which is after Humanity Generous, the encyclical that Pius XII issues. One of the most famous of these manuals is Ludwig, Ludwig, Ludwig Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. I mentioned this because this is a sort of uh, text that traditionalist Catholics love. It's actually a very good text in many ways. Uh, it, uh, it also repeats essentially the idea that, yes, in some regards, evolution is compatible with the Catholic faith. So you do have efforts by perfectly traditional theologians to do this before 1950. You also have some less than traditional attempts uh, to, uh, to reconcile evolution with Catholic teaching. The most unconventional, uh, without doubt, being that uh, of Th Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who <clears throat> was a French paleontologist, uh, born in 1881, dies in 1955, uh, most of his writings are actually scientific and they deal with you know, paleontology. He worked for many years in China on a geological survey, but he also, he was a, Je a Jesuit priest. I should have forgot to mention that. He, um, he also wrote books about evolution and man's role in all this. He actually wrote articles too. He wrote two books during his lifetime, which his Jesuit superiors forbade him to publish. And the reason why will become obvious when I, when I actually tell you what his theory was. He tries to reconcile uh, evolution with a Christian ideal of the whole universe in ways that are that baffle a lot of people, let's put it that way. And what his theory is this, his theory is that uh, to him, um, matter itself evolves toward greater and greater forms of complexity from simple to greater. Uh, ending with the emergence of life itself, and then to the next stage of evolution, then with the human body, which allows for humanity to have self-consciousness, awareness, morality, all this stuff. After this, he has this idea that humanity will grow itself into greater and greater self-consciousness until it reaches what he calls the omega point of history. That is to say, the point of spiritual uni unity towards which everything, both humanity, but also the universe itself, toward a personal union with God. And in fact, later in his life, he writes a book called What I, what I Meant to Say, which he gives four theses for his, I'll, I say this because it's not really clear exactly why in many ways. If you read his books, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, he put this in four theses. One, he says, I believe that the universe, the universe is an evolution, the universe itself, the physical universe. Two, I believe that evolution proceeds toward the spiritual. Three, I believe that the spiritual is fully realized in a form of personality. And then four, finally, I believe that the supremely personal is the universal Christ. What does all of that mean? Quite honestly, uh, it depends on who you ask, because I have attempted to read uh, some of his books. I'm not sure it means much of anything, to be honest with you. Uh, I think, and I have to say, uh, in addition, by the way, to his Jesuit superiors forbidding him to publish this stuff in his lifetime, uh, the Vatican, his books were never condemned. Uh, but they were, the Vatican did issue a monotum, a, a Latin word for a warning, against accepting his ideas uncritically in 1962. I say all this because to this day, Teilhard is still very popular with, I think it's fair to say, uh, what you'd call liberal or progressive Catholics. And it was very popular at the time. I think he got his, they got his picture put on the cover of Time magazine at one point. And the reason why is very simple. Teilhard has this quasi pantheistic sounding view of the universe based on what sounds like using evolution as a metaphor for man's spiritual development or something. I really don't know. And um, the reason why this caught on with people is because they were, you know, by the 1940s, I mentioned Catholics in the 19th century weren't that educated. Well, now most of them, a lot of them are going to college. They're, they're being exposed to this stuff. 
And Teilhard gave them a way of seeing humanity at the center of the world again, essentially, effectively. That's essentially what his, what his if, as far as I can understand it, his ideas uh, amounted to. I should, I should probably mention that pretty much everybody else, more traditional believers uh, and scientists as well, because he actually claims in one of his books, The Phenomenon of Man, that what he is doing is science. And that, trust me, no scientist could take any of this stuff seriously. And uh, they, everybody else views him with, uh, with a lot of skepticism. It's not, I don't want to offend anybody who might be listening, but it's not exactly the most rigorous philosophy I've ever read, I'll put it that way. But i just give you one, one last example of how popular it was. Some of you probably listening to this are probably fans of the Catholic author, um, Southern author, Flannery O'Connor, right? Great novelist, short story writer. She titled one of her novels, Everything That Rises Must Converge. That was taken from Teilhard's book. That's what they, she's talking about the Omega point, that everything is evolving toward this higher plane of spirituality or some stuff like this. So there you go. Um, <laughs> that's Teilhard de Chardin. Well, anyway, in 1950, the church finally issues what, to this day, as far as I'm, I know, is the most authoritative statement on the teaching of uh, evolution and its, you know, um, compatibility or not with the Catholic faith. And this is the encyclical of Pope Pius XII, Humani Generis, on human origins, human generation which was issued mostly, by the way, to issue warnings about certain trends in theology and philosophy within the church at the time. I won't belabor that point. It's only in three paragraphs that he actually addresses on the subject of evolution. And actually, if you, I'll, po I'll post this somewhere in the, if I can, a link to a, a Google Doc or something where you can find this if you want to find it. You can find this on the internet. But I, in my handout for, one, for people who showed up to the actual uh, actual uh, speech uh, lecture, uh, I have the three paragraphs here, and I'm not going to read through all this and waste your time too much, but to sum it up, he allows that, yes, you can have research that may be conducted, which presumes that the human body was created through human evolution, but not the soul, uh, and he says this right here in paragraph 36. That's okay. He says, even as far as the origin of the human body is coming from pre-existent moving matter, or the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. Notice what he also says there. I'll highlight this here myself. He, however, this must be done. Well, I can't. Oh yeah, I can highlight it. This must be done in such a way that the reasons both for for both opinions, that is, both favorable and unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness, moderation, and measure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I mention that because he's still worried about other things. You see this here. Uh, he's saying people doesn't want them to transgress uh, um, certain bounds of discussion. And particularly, he says he doesn't want people to proceed as if certain things have been, uh, as if uh, uh, origin of the human body had already been proved completely and certainly. And again, by 1950, maybe, uh, I think maybe the, the scientific consensus at that point, yeah, again, maybe you could have some uh, um, a wiggle room with this. But again, he's he's urging caution and, and basically because he's also concerned about the way people treat the Bible. He says down here in 36, um, people are rash who transgress the liberty of discussion as if there were nothing in the sources of divine revelation which demands the greatest moderation and caution in this question. So he does say you can open up to the be open to the idea that the human body was created by natural uh, natural means. What he does not, what he also what he does actually condemn this. I have to come back to this. I haven't mentioned this yet, but he rejects categorically the idea of polygenism. Uh, what polygenism basically means is that um, again the church's teaching is that we had two ancestors, a couple, Adam and Eve, from which we're all descended. Polygenism is the, the theory that human beings emerged biologically speaking on earth from not from two, uh, from a couple, but from different groups of people at around about the same time. And the reason why he takes this, uh, takes this position is because, and he says down here, it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regards to original sin, because the church's teaching both, uh, which is enunciated clearly in uh, the documents of the Council of Trent, is that we did have two parents, 
Adam and Eve did sin and through gen human generation, they passed that on to everyone else. So the problem there is of course, with original sin, it's actually something, uh, there's less legal wiggle room of that because of that. And that basically to this day is effectively where it ends the development of the church's teaching. A few last things, we'll get done, done with this real quickly. Church and evolutionary theory today. Um, there have been a few magisterial statements uh, made by Pope since Humanity Generous. The most, uh, uh, if Patrick Callahan, my, <laughs> my Latin teacher friend is, is watching, please don't criticize my pronunciation too much of these Latin terms. Uh, John Paul II gave a speech in 1996 uh, to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in which he in which he said, quote unquote, that evolution was now more than a hypothesis, unquote. What that means, I, he's effectively acknowledging the consensus that yes, the human body, that's the consensus that it was created by, obviously by, uh, by natural means. That's essentially all, that's as far as he goes. He doesn't really say much else in that speech. He just repeats a lot of what Pius XII said in his encyclical. One other thing John Paul II does, he opens up the Vatican archives for study, which is where we know, we, that's where we get this stuff, uh, the stuff I've gotten for this lecture about of Vatican's response to theologians, you know, probings of this question. There was the International Theological Commission um, was a, is a standing body the Vatican has in, to investigate theological questions. It issued a report in 2004. I don't think it said much of anything very, very novel or worth mentioning. And of course, both Benedict the 16th and Francis have made statements more Francis than Benedict, which is kind of surprising. And even Francis is, is an off the cuff. Yes, evolution is, is you know, uh, acceptable and uh, that sort of thing. So not much from the magisterium. What about evolutionary theory today? Well, a couple of things. The basic framework of the theory itself is effectively stable and established within science. That is to say the two main things that Darwin came up with, common ancestry and natural selection. No one has effectively overturned that as a, as a scientific explanation for the evolution of the species. Having said all that, within that framework, there is a there is a there's a lot of diversity of approaches and opinions within uh, evolutionary science. And in fact, you should see it as a spectrum in many ways between some people who are more minimalist in terms of, you know, being closer to Darwin or uh, in that regard, others that think that there are differences, different things at play besides natural selection. There are still to this day, if I'm not mistaken, scientists who are not convinced that natural selection explains everything in terms of how, um, in terms of how uh, species evolve. So, and, and, and just think, by the way, in terms of compatibility with the church teaching, there's also a spectrum of acceptability because on the one hand, Yes, some version of common ancestry, natural selection is compatible with the Catholic faith. On the other hand, you have the sort of neo-Darwinian, um, Richard Dawkins-like, you know, not only is evolution the answer to evolution of species, it's the answer to everything. It proves there's no, that, that, that's obviously not compatible. You don't need to belabor that too much. However, there is one, uh, aspect of contemporary evolutionary theory, which poses a problem for the church, which is that the current state of thinking, and I think this is different in 1950 when Pius XII issued his encyclical, is that uh, scientists, scientific consensus at the moment is for the polygenic origins of humanity. That is to say, the, the consensus seems to be that human beings, uh, homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens, uh, emerged among different groups of, in, uh, of humanoids in Africa about 100,000 years ago. And that our oldest ancestor as a species with genetically identifiable DNA goes back that far. And in fact, you may have heard about this. It's made it into the press uh, years ago as I think it was the mitochondrial Eve because our an the ancestor was supposed to be a woman, but it was only a single ancestor. There's no couple there. So it poses a problem in theological terms. So how does how do theologians deal with that problem? Well, basically, I'm not there are two. I'm not an expert on this, but there are two ways I've found in researching this that you can deal with this. The first was a, an idea that actually uh, has gotten a lot of play lately. Uh, was suggested first back in the 1960s by a Jesuit theologian, uh, Kenneth Kemp is the name to know. He's written a book about evolution. He's written a book. Of, he's written an article about this, but 
he came up with the idea of a distinction between theological and biological species. And the, the, the idea is simple. If you presuppose that human, the human body was created through natural selection, that you have you know, human uh, species created that way in terms of their, um, their uh, physical structures, that essentially they are biological species, they are homo sapiens. But the idea is that God at a certain point when they became you know, physically capable of receiving an immortal soul infuses them with, uh, with that essentially. And that effectively a human being is not merely uh, a, a biological construct. It means that sort of God has to add or infuse the soul for it to be a, a theological species. And so you treat humankind as something different from homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens are biological uh, species basically. And that's one way, that's probably the most accessible way of doing this. The other avenue for solving this is a little more complicated and much more recent and this is the idea of a distinction between genetic and genealogical ancestry. <laughs> Let me see if I can explain this simply and clearly. So genetic ancestry is pretty, pretty straightforward. It's the DNA, you know, you match, you know, genetic uh, material going back. And that's what we're talking about with, uh, with the mitochondrial eat, right? Our, our genetic ancestors go back 100,000 years. However, scientists uh, have recently hit on something kind of strange which is that uh, in simplified terms, genetically you, re you receive half of your genetic material from your, your mother and father, right? 46 chromosomes, 23 apiece. Mathematically speaking, that means you, you, you uh, receive 11 and a half chromosomes from your grandfather, five, five and a quarter from your great grandparent and back having back as your father you go back, fewer and fewer fractions of a chromosome. However, to again, simplify this, you don't actually inherit chromosomes fractionally. <laughs> uh, and so basically what it means is you might, might actually have received you know, 0 0.020 whatever of chromosomes from one of your distant ancestors, right? Or put another way, from someone you know to be related to. Let's say, for example, someone 300 years ago, uh, a British guy goes to, uh, goes to India and founds, uh, founds a business there, founds a, founds a noble dynasty or something like this. I'm getting this example from someone else, by the way, friend, <laughs> somebody gave me this to me. Uh, goes to India, intermarries with a local woman and starts a dynasty who's, you know, and we have, you know, records, birth records that connect all this stuff. Uh, and so you can trace the lineage over generations and yet, and bearing, still bearing his name perhaps. And yet when you sequence his DNA, his descendants are identical to the local population. Now, what this means is though, but he's still their great, he's still their ancestor, in other words. In other words, you can have ancestry that's not determinable by uh, normal genetic means. And so how do you do this when you go back beyond, you know, uh, when the, the trace of your, their genetic code disappears? You do this through statistical modeling. And in fact, uh, um, uh, genetic scientists have done this. And what they figured out is, they figured out that the the earliest uh, genealogical ancestors that human beings on earth right now, like 2019 um, or so, 2019, 2020, the earliest, uh, earliest period back in time that uh, human beings, all the human beings on earth have the same set of ancestors. This is called identical ancestor point. It means uh, the farthest back in time we actually have a couple that we descend from, like, like that guy in that example I gave you. Uh, is about five to 10,000 or five to 15,000 years, depending on which uh, mathematical models you use. Now, um, in his book, as a book published a couple of years ago by Joshua Swamadas, who's an evangelical genetic science uh, called the genealogical Adam Eve, he points out is, is that basically this means that yes, everyone on earth today has, is, is descended from a couple. And what he also points out is that time frame I gave you, five to 10, five to 15,000 years ago, is at least consistent with the traditional dating for the creation of Adam and Eve, which is about 6,000 6, years ago. And so what that means, and he points this out in his book, this one Das does, is that if you wanted to believe that God created, directly created the body of Adam and Eve, there's nothing against, nothing in that, nothing against, uh, 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 nothing, that's at least incompatible with that evidence to say, yes, God could have created two 
um, identical human, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens in the Middle East 6,000 years ago, given them immortal souls and had them um, intermingle the rest of the population that was already on Earth. Essentially, they were humanoids. Now, you'd still have to believe in something like miracles to make that happen, but it's the point is it's consistent with the evidence we have, oddly enough. Uh, that doesn't mean, by the way, it's the best scientific explanation. It is not for, for the creation of the human body, but it's at least acceptable. And again, I'm mentioning this here because go back to what Pius XII said. He said, you do at least have to entertain arguments for the opposite hypothesis uh, for evolution. And so my point to wrap things up is that you, if you want to believe in the traditional, you know, fairly strictly literal version of Adam and Eve, you can still get away with it, basically. You could probably get scorned for it, but it, it's still ex, it's still possible, even according to those sorts of things, at least at the moment. Again, the status of scientific consensus and evidence changes over time. And But finally, maybe a few last reflections on all this. A um, couple of things to note about all this. I think we need to, again, acknowledge and appreciate the moderation of Rome and the hierarchy's approach to this. Over the last hundred years or so, a lot of things have gone wrong <laughs> with the hierarchy and Rome, but they have been consistently on this from 1860 onward, I think, judicious about how they've handled this. I guess it's, I say this because, and if you don't know, my, I think a lot of what the church gets criticized for in the Galileo affairs is kind of myth and propaganda, yet they did open themselves up to that. They have been much more careful in this, in this instance. They learned. They learned from their history that is so rare. Give them a hand. <laughs> Uh, to where the church's teaching stands today. I think we're already going through that, but it's, it's basically where it's been since 1950, more or less. Third, a couple of things, a couple more things about just talking about evolution, talking about science and faith or science and theology and science and religion. If you're wondering about all this stuff about, oh, you know, these sound like very minute explanations, aren't maybe or maybe uh, theologians coming up with answers to these questions after the fact, in fact, or they seem kind of maybe a little too you know, convenient or whatever, or something like that, maybe if you're skeptical, I don't know. I think we need to step back for a second and think about uh, the methodolo methodological and linguistic boundaries of both theology and science. Um, because one of the way that, one of the things about um, science and theology is that sometimes in science and theology, they don't yield to us immediate answers to questions we really like to have. And I'm gonna do this and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm gonna go back to Galileo actually to illustrate what I mean by that. We all know Galileo, of course, was right in that uh, the, the universe is constructed, uh, uh, it's heliocentric, right? Our, our earth removes, uh, moves around the sun. However, in 1632, when he was, his book was condemned by the, by the Inquisition, that had not been proven yet. And in fact, what the Inquisition uh, condemned him for was uh, teaching that it had been proved. It had not. Not all scientists were convinced of the, uh, of the heliocentric theory at that point. The scientific community was still divided. And again, as in a later period, the church was concerned about what that might, what, what the undermining of a literal reading of the Bible might have on the, on the faithful. Now, it turned out in the end that uh, Galileo, of course, was correct. That happens in science. Sometimes you have a theory, it gets overturned later on. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And in fact, it took a half century to prove him right. And it wasn't uh, anything, by the way, anyone discovered that proved him right. It was mathematics. It was brilliant theoretical genius of, of Newton that proved uh, Galileo correct. Again, it's not a matter of the church denying the evidence of the senses or something at that point. It was not decided until then. However, what you probably don't know about Galileo's uh, little affair is that many of the arguments he used in his book, uh, The Dialogue Concerning the Two Cheap World Systems for which he was condemned, a lot of the arguments he used for heliocentrism were also turned out to be false. I'll give you a, a famous example. One of his arguments for the idea that, the, yes, the Earth moved around the sun was the tides. 
he claimed that the Earth's movement around the sun and it's spinning on its own axis caused the tides in the ocean. Now, if you think about that for like five minutes, you can kind of tell that's BS. And in fact, people at the time said this, they criticized him for this. As far as I'm aware, Galileo never backed off of it. Eventually, of course, it was proved false, but it took 200 years till the 1830s to finally definitively put that theory to rest. And my point is here in the scientific realm, sometimes you don't get automatic answers. The same thing is true of, of uh, theology. Uh, famously, in the Middle Ages, uh, when Aristotle, Arist Aristotelian philosophy, um, the corpus of his text, made it back into Western Europe, into Latin in the 12th and 13th centuries, it caused a sensation because Aristotle's philosophy is really great. It could do some neat things for Christian theology, but it also, in its, in its uh, form as it came from the ancient world, is not compatible with Christian theology in many ways. You know, Aristotle thought the soul died with the body. He taught that the world was eternal. And so a lot of people were kind of uneasy about Aristotle. And it took several centuries. It took several, not just several brilliant theologians, but theologians who were also saints, Thomas Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, other people, to carefully and safely sort of shear off the elements in Aristotle that were not compatible with the faith and make it work. And in fact, really, really, it's not until the 16th century that uh, Thomistic, uh, Thomas the Thomistic theology really comes into, into its own as a school in the church. People are that wary of it. And so I mentioned that to, to, to point that out to you. Sometimes we don't get answers the way we want. But I also point out to you that um, sometimes theology and uh, uh, theology and at least Catholic theology and modern science uh, have linguistic barriers for people who don't understand modern intellectual disciplines. And what I mean by that is sometimes, well, just sometimes, but both the natural sciences and theology have their own languages. That is to say, they use words in a very specific and precise way that's specific to their discipline. And you can get fooled by this. I'll give you one example from the natural sciences. Sometimes when you hear scientists talk about random mutations or random this that happens in nature. And again, they may be, you know, Richard Dawkins-like propagandists, but more likely they're referring to a, a, a element of statistical randomness. In other words, there's no statistical correlation between this and that thing they're talking about. They don't, they don't mean that, yes, because the statistical, cor the statistical correlation doesn't exist, that there is no God or something. Not, they don't mean that. They're using an ordinary term in a more technical way. Uh, theology, Catholic theology has always has done this for a long time. Just take an obvious instance, transubstantiation, a word that, uh, quite frankly, non-Catholics non bitch about a lot. <laughs> uh, but we have our own language for talking about revelation. Sometimes it will lead for, for, to, to misunderstandings, in a way. And that finally leads me to the last thing, uh, is that, again, not a lot of people are, are, are versed in both of those languages. So sometimes you, know, you will have tensions between um, what the church teaches and, and what the secular world or what the natural sciences, what even the historical sciences teach. Uh, there are going to be tensions. There are going to be problems. That's going to happen. Doesn't mean they necessarily conflict or contradict or each other. Talk to each other. It also means, by the way, and I, this is the last thing I'll mention, I, I gave this speech and I'm talking about where the church's teaching stands. If you have problems with the idea of, again, evolution in terms of the, of the human body, if you have you know, you know, problems with that, if that causes you some distress, it's okay. That doesn't mean A, you're losing your faith. B, that doesn't mean you, again, as I mentioned, you can kind of reconcile that for the moment, at least a, a, a more traditional uh, way of interpreting Genesis that way. Um, it's okay to admit that. It's okay to talk about that. Uh, difficulties are not the same things as doubts, and uh, it's it's not a bar to believing. Uh, I'll give you. I'll end with the last personal anecdote. I've never had many problems with evolution. You know what I have had problems with in my life that used to really freak, not anymore. I've kind of gotten over it. I've matured. What used to really freak me out really badly was when I was a kid. I think I was within like sixth grade, 10, 10, or 10, 11 years old, when I first realized, really hit me, the, the, the scale 
of the actual universe. I mean, both in time and space. The idea that the universe is 7 billion years old, the idea that it's this, you know, that human beings are eff effectively an infinitesimal speck of dust in, a, in an otherwise infinite universe. It kind of threw me off for a long time. It was hard, it made it hard to like, you know, conceive, you know, again, you think about the change from modern, from pre-modern to modern society, you know, when the universe is 6,000 years old and there's just, just the earth there, it's like, yeah, it's nice and snug and it seems intimate. Um, it, it takes a little getting used to um, the idea that it's that big and yet, what, I'm this tiny speck of dust and God takes an interest in my life? Answers yes, of course. Um, but again, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, uh, having admitting tensions. They are not the end of things. And there is always uh, more to say. And usually, usually the, the, the church, churches, uh, the church is teaching that yes, those truths do in the end, uh, the truths of faith and science uh, become compatible. Uh, I think it'll be proved right in the end. So that is my lecture. Hopefully it wasn't too long. I don't know how long we went. Uh, I will stop sharing right here. Uh, thank you people for watching. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Um, one last thing before I, I head out. Uh, next lecture coming up, I want to say it's the 27th of March. I don't know. Last Sunday, 7 p.m., same place, Guardian Angels Parish. Um, my lecture will be on the modernist crisis uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So thank you guys. And uh, I uh, hope I'll see you some of you guys next time.